Hey guys, Dan here with uh, today's quarantine video taking a look at four recently released movies on Netflix. I've been trying to do four movies every single week uh, since the shutdown began, but uh, all the theatrical movies have uh, pretty much dried up at this point, so uh, I'm looking to the streaming services. Uh, and actually next week, Scoob will be released, the uh, new Warner Brothers uh, Scooby-Doo movie that was supposed to be released in theaters next weekend, that is going directly to On Demand. So I will have that one next week, but um, for now I have four Netflix movies uh, from the last like month and a half, two months. Um, some of the higher profile movies. I looked at the, the list of their 2020 films. They've released over 30 movies this year so far, and uh, 19 of them have been in English or half in English, so they do have a lot of foreign movies as well uh, on on the service, but um, there are a lot of movies in general to watch on Netflix, so um, I usually don't get to more than maybe eight or ten of them a year, um, and that's in a good year. Last year they had a bunch of Oscar nominees, so I watched a bunch of those, of course, and then Dolomite is My Name, and um, you know some of the more buzzy movies, Tall Girl I watched, um, but... Uh, in the last few weeks, they've had some real high-profile ones. Extraction, starring uh, Chris Hemsworth, is still in the Netflix Daily Top Ten. Um, and then you've got The Willoughbys, which is an animated movie that is also still in the Top Ten. That's been out for about two or three weeks. Um, and then Spencer Confidential is uh, one with Mark Wahlberg that sort of... I had known what it was when it came out, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll get to that if I have the time. So uh, finally watch that. And then, um, as I've been doing with these movie reviews, the fourth movie, I sort of um, go a little bit deeper and try and, and dig and find something that maybe I wouldn't have known about otherwise, and that's a movie they just released this past weekend called The Half of It. So we're going to talk about that. It was a Sundance favorite. But uh, let's go in the order that I mentioned. The, uh, actually, we won't do that, because I think we'll do Extraction and Spencer together, since they're both the heavy-hitting action movies. But we're going to start with Extraction, and uh, this is, um, like I said, starring Chris Hemsworth, um, and he plays Tyler Rake, who is a former Australian uh, military ops person, and now he is a black market mercenary, um, and he is going on a, a big extraction of his career, um, and he is enlisted, essentially, to uh, rescue the kidnapped son of an international crime lord who uh, is in jail himself. So, um, and the kid is played by uh, Rude, uh, Rude Rash uh, Jaiswal. I should have probably looked at that before <laughs> before this, but um, and he he's basically the other star of the movie. I mean, he's in just about as much scenes uh, or as many scenes as, as Chris Hemsworth is in. And uh, you know, through this, we see a lot of you know takedowns and a lot of gunplay and a lot of chases and um, a few other people enter the fray and of course um, the kid whose name uh, is Ovi or uh, I guess yeah his name's Ovi and then the, the dad is Ovi as well Ovi Sr. Um, so you know he enters into the picture of course and right from the very first scene we are just thrown into this thing um, and I had I had uh, recognized the name of the director it's Sam Hargrave um, who, actually, this is his first directing effort, but he um, was the stunt coordinator for several of the Marvel movies, um, including Captain America Civil War and two of the Avengers films. Um, and also he had you know small acting roles in movies like Atomic Blonde as well, which was very action-heavy as well. Um, but it was produced by the Russo brothers, um, and of course they have their hands very deeply in uh, the Avengers world and the and the MCU in general, they uh, directed both Infinity War and Endgame and Captain America: Civil War. Um, so for them to be involved in this, you know, you can see first of all why they got Chris Hemsworth involved, but uh, second of all why uh, the action is so well choreographed. So um, essentially, as we go through this movie, and it is almost two hours long, um, although like. 12 or 13 minutes of that is end credits. The end credits are forever. So, really, movie-wise, it's about an hour and 45. Um, and it's it's almost non-stop action. There's a few scenes um, that are a little more pensive, and, um, you know, there's, there's some touching scenes with him and the kid and uh, with some of the other characters, but for the most part, it is, 
you know, as they say, a non-stop thrill ride. Um, and that can, you know, go one of two ways. I mean, that can not end up so great, um, or it can be very exciting and exhilarating like, uh, you know, the John Wick movies or some of the Tarantino movies that are more heavily reliant on uh, violence than some others, like Kill Bill, for example. Um, and this one, for me, really got the job done in that uh, that second area. I mean, the biggest problems with the movie um, are just that it's, you know, it's so very action-heavy. We don't really get to know a lot about these characters. I mean, we know from... Uh, Rake's interaction with the kid that, you know, he's he's got a good heart and he's not just necessarily doing a job. He's, you know, he's forged a connection with this kid and uh, wants to, you know, really see him get out of this alive and, and, and be spared and everything. So um, you can tell that. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of detail within these characters. Um, but that being said, um, this is... Now, it is way too violent, I, I will say that. The violence is very gratuitous. It's, you know, for me, it's the violence is way overdone. It's too much for me. However, I think it is safe to say that this is the most well-shot and well-choreographed uh, action sequences, gun violence, um, fight uh, coordination, um, fight choreography, whatever that I've seen, I mean, probably since maybe John Wick 2, maybe even John Wick 1. I mean, I think John Wick 2, they were a little more, like, on their game because they're like, okay, now we're a big hit, so we got to make the second one, you know, better. But, you know, uh, the thing with violence in movies, especially, like, nonstop action movies, and I think of ones like... Um, you know, like some of the Stallone movies, like Bullet to the Head, or even the last Rambo movie, or, you know, some of the uh, Schwarzenegger movies, or some of the, um, you know, like Jason Statham type movies, is that the the violence moves so quickly, and the camera shakes so much, like Taken is a great example of this, you know, and, and the quick edits and all of that. And here, man, you see every single, you know, gunshot. You see exactly who's firing the gun, who it's going to, um, you know, I was never confused about who was shooting at Rake, uh, who he was trying to kill. Now, there's a lot of sort of generic, violent, uh, villain people in this movie, so I may not know necessarily who the people specifically are, but I can see, you know, where that shot is going. And in fact, there's, there's one scene that, um, is sort of made to look like a one take, obviously it's not, but um, it, it lasts about probably 10 or 11 minutes, and it's just non-stop. You see people being thrown off buildings, you see all the gunplay, you see, you know, the camera will whip around then and see it from a different perspective. I mean, this thing is shot so incredibly well. Um, for it to be this guy's, you know, directorial debut is super impressive. It's not surprising to me at all that he is a stunt coordinator um, because, you know, the, the the stunt scenes, the heavy violent scenes, and there's a lot of them, um, are all very, very well choreographed and directed. Um, so what this movie lacks in script, I guess, or um, character development or anything like that, it's, it's, it's really almost trumped by just how gorgeously shot uh, everything is. And again, for me, it is too violent. Uh, you know, I don't think I'll ever watch this movie again. Um, they've already greenlit a sequel, so, you know, I'll, I'll watch that, you know, if I'm going to review it or whatever. Um, but, and, you know, by the way, it's, it's almost a giveaway of sorts that the sequel's been announced and that Hemsworth has signed on for it. Um, you know, because there's a lot of things in this movie that, maybe look one way, but then you find out Hemsworth signed on for the sequel, and you're like, oh, all right. Um, and I guess really from the last shot of this movie, it's it's very sequel baity. So, you know, I, they were leaving the door open, certainly, for that possibility. But um, 
you know, that's not really spoiler on my end. It's more on the end of the announcement that Hemsworth is going to be attached to Extraction 2. But, um, you know, I, I did see that there was some controversy about, um, you know, how some of the Bangladeshi um, figures were portrayed and how um, even some of, like, the signage is, is incorrect. You know, I, I know I'm a little nitpicky when it comes to, like, soundtrack cuts if it's like a flashback scene and they're playing a song that didn't exist when they're flashing back to so uh, you know i obviously don't know the language so it didn't stick out to me but there is something to be said to you know pay a little attention to detail in that regard but um but yeah almost all of the generic things in this movie are outweighed by how well shot it is i just i can't remember the last time i saw an ultra violent movie like this where I just knew everything that was going on and exactly who was firing the gun and where it was coming from and, you know, and who the person was. And um, so I, I have to give it credit for that. There's no doubt about it. So um, it's certainly flawed, but it is, it's weird to say that it's a gorgeous looking movie because it's ugly in its, you know, ultra violent sequences. Um, but it's it's pretty good to look at, I, I have to be honest. Um, and if you're into violent movies and you don't care as much about the plot, um, then this is certainly better than, like, a lot of the recent Fast and Furious movies. And, you know, there's a lot of crappy movies out there that are just very action-heavy and not much substance. This doesn't have a lot of substance, but the action is just beautiful to look at uh and and so so well done and choreographed so uh, i'm going to leave extraction with a b plus uh a, a little more work on the character development and, a, and maybe a couple more scenes of uh some some conversation and stuff like that uh and and i could have seen this actually being an a because it's just so well shot um, but unfortunately, that stuff wasn't there. So let's move in next then to um, Spencer Confidential. And uh, you'll see what I'm saying uh, when I say that uh, sometimes movies are just all action and, and they're not that good. Um, spoiler alert for my review. Uh, so Spencer Confidential is very, very loosely based on uh, the old show Spencer for Hire starring Robert Urich back from the 80s, which I was too young for. I never watched it. Um, I know it mostly because in an episode of Cheers, um, they were filming an episode in Boston because it takes place in Boston, um, and Woody on Cheers became an extra in one of the Spencer for Hire episodes. That's like what I know it best for. Um, but anyway, so this is very loosely based on that, and uh, it does take place in Boston, though. Mark Wahlberg, of course, doing uh, his, his great home accent. Um, and two Boston police officers are murdered here. Um, and so ex-cop Spencer teams up with Hawk, his uh, roommate, to take down these criminals. And uh, there's a lot of sort of, you know, inside cop, like, oh, he's, you know, the cops are in on it, and he's a bad cop, and I'm going to take him down. And um, it, it pairs Wahlberg again with Peter Berg, who has uh, done Lone Survivor and Patriot's Day and Deepwater Horizon and Mile 22. So he is a longtime Wahlberg uh, supporter. And they do work well together, typically, um, but this is more Mile 22 than any of those other movies. Those other movies, it's almost like diminishing returns, because I thought Lone Survivor was easily the best of those five. Uh, and then Deepwater Horizon and Patriot's Day were both, like, pretty solid. Mile 22 was, like, rough. I gave that probably a D. Um, I didn't grade it here on the channel, but in, in my notes, uh, I gave that a D. Maybe a D+, plus, but I don't think so. I think it was a D. Um, so this fares slightly better than that, but uh, to be honest, not much. Um, so basically, uh, Hawk here is played uh, by Winston Duke, and that was played by Avery Brooks from the Star Trek universe um, in the original Spencer TV show. But we also have Alan Arkin here as um, Henry Simoli, and Eliza Schlesinger, the comedian, as uh, Sissy Davis, which is sort of weird. And then uh, Post Malone shows up here as an inmate. And, um, you know, he can act okay, but I just, I, looking at him just makes me angry. And I like some of his songs. I, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily I'm a Post Malone fan, but I do like some of his songs. I think he's got a great voice. Um, but 
he's just such a garbage person to look at, and it makes me angry. So, and he shows up pretty early on. He comes back later in the movie, but he shows up in one of the first scenes, and I'm just like, is that effing Post Malone? Or do they just get somebody with similar facial, facial tattoos to make him look like Post Malone? No, it's him, all right. His acting's all right. But um, this movie just doesn't quite work. Um, you know, it, it is a lot of action that doesn't really lead us anywhere. It is shot in that you know, classic action movie way that we've come to know lately, um, with, you know, fast cameras and, you know, what's going on and, you know, there's a car chase and it, you know, hap it goes this way and, you know, every, every, everything is sort of just out there. Let's just throw everything at the wall, see if it looks good, see if it works. Um, they try for comedy in several different scenes and it never seems to get off the ground. It's, it's almost like sort of you know, forced kind of cringe-inducing comedy, so that part didn't fly with me. Um, even Mark Wahlberg seemed a little bit off here. You know, his, his it didn't seem like his heart was really in it, um, and I I don't know why that is. I don't know if he's been playing these these same type of action roles for so long that it's just sort of second nature to him, so he doesn't really put his all into it. I'm not sure. Um, but the biggest surprise for me in this movie was actually Eliza Schlesinger. Um, and I think she's, she's a funny person, you know, on the roasts and stuff. And I actually reviewed her Netflix TV show not too long ago, um, to sort of middling, uh, reviews. But, um, she really goes all out here, both with the accent. She lays on the accent very thick, but it's very authentic. Like, I, I didn't find it to be overdone or annoying i it reminded me a lot of speaking of mark Wahlberg, um but the fighter with um like with amy adams and melissa leo and and, and that whole group um because she does eliza schlesinger's character does yell a lot uh in this movie um you know alan arkin is is doing his thing um you know he's always kind of alan arkin these days um so he was all right but nothing new really there um and I just, I, I didn't understand uh, the point of a lot of this. You know, it, it all seemed to just be not really going anywhere. The character development's horrible. Like, I mean, it's not good in Extraction, but at least Extraction was nice to look at. Um, th this is just sort of like, I don't know if I'm necessarily even rooting for these people. I guess I am, because they're the good guys. And th I will admit, there is one, uh, like the, the climax scene at the end uh, actually pulled off everything that the movie was going for the whole time and failing, which is like, it was kind of funny, uh, and it was definitely action-packed, and it was satisfying. Like, it was the most satisfying scene of the movie, probably. Um, and if, if the whole movie was like that, then it would have been great. But uh, it was so directionless for so long that by the time that final scene came up, it was like, okay, I, I'm, I've got a smile on my face, but like, I still don't really care what happens, and I don't care about any of these people, but I will admit that was a well-done scene. Um, but you shouldn't have to wait an hour and 45 minutes to get to that point. So um, this is definitely, definitely on the, the low end of the Peterberg mark Wahlberg team-up. I leave Spencer Confidential with a D+. Um, so up next, we're going to talk about The Willoughbys. This is a uh, an animated film uh, based on a, uh, a book of the same name, uh, by Lois Lowry, which, um, I've, I definitely know her, I mean, I know she's, you know, a Newberry Medal winner, she's, she's done a lot of things, I'm not sure, um, if I know any of her books, let me see here, oh, she wrote The Giver, okay, that's why I know Lois Lowry, she wrote The Giver, which, of course, became a, a big hit movie about, I don't know, seven years ago or something, um, but uh, this is based on that book. Uh, from what I understand, it doesn't really um, veer that close to the book. But um, essentially, this movie is about a group of kids who have a terrible upbringing. They're played by uh, Will, voiced, I should say, by Will Forte and uh, singer Elisa Cara. Um, and basically, they're like, how can we get out of this uh, life? How can we get our parents away, um, so they send them on a vacation, um, and then embark on their own adventure, they find a baby that they, um, then have to do something with, and then 
they end up uh, getting a nanny who is voiced by Maya Rudolph. Um, and, you know, she may not be all she's wrapped up to be either. Um, the parents are played by uh, Martin Short and Jane Krakowski. They're not in the movie all that much, just sort of to bookend it. They're not really in the middle at all. Um, and then Terry Crews uh, plays this dude um, that, like, owns... He's sort of like a Willy Wonka dude. He uh, owns a candy factory. His name is uh, Commander Melanoff. Um, and... Uh, there's also, like, some creepy twins in here, uh, voiced by Sean Cullen, and then Ricky Gervais is sort of the narrator, and he also, you know, voices the neighborhood cat that sort of sees everything going on. Um, this movie is, uh, animated in a way that I don't necessarily like. Um, I don't mind it if it's legitimately, um, like, stop motion, but this is made to look like stop motion and isn't. It's all CGI, um, and it's one thing, like, when the Lego movie did it, it was sort of brilliant, because Legos, you know, when you're playing with them, would sort of move like that and everything, so that made sense. South Park, that makes sense, because they started out, and it really was, like, cardboard cutouts and sort of stop-motion style, um, so they just make it look like that now, because that's how it's always been, but... I, I, this is the same animation team that did, like, The Addams Family, and again, made sense for that because that had the look and feel of the original comics. Um, but for something like this, it just, it didn't quite work for me just because it's sort of like a creepy story a little bit. Um, I think they were like, oh, well, we can make it look kind of creepy too. But the animation style, when it's not authentic um, or there's not a good reason to do it, just doesn't, it, it just kind of looks ugly to me. So that was uh, issue number one. Although I will say some of the scenes, especially like in the Candy Factory, are extremely colorful and fun to look at. I can't deny that. But um, the majority of the scenes are sort of a more drab and dreary sort of thing. Um, I mean, the, this, I didn't read the book, but the movie at least has a very, very like Lemony Snicket type of vibe to it, um, both in themes and in look and sort of just in in tone um and in the basic conceit of like family is what you make of it kind of thing um so with that in mind it's it's obviously on all counts nothing we haven't seen before i also thought um that will forte was sort of just phoning in the uh the the vocal performance which is a bummer because i i like him i loved his tv show last man on earth um and some of the other uh animation work i thought he he's done pretty well but here um i don't know it just seemed very it's it was very like this is will forte speaking like he didn't put on any kind of a voice um and not that you always have to i mean you know buzz lightyear is certainly tim allen and and woody is certainly tom hanks i mean they're not really doing accents or anything, but, um, I don't know, for, for a, the character of a young kid, it just didn't seem to work that well, but that all being said, like, I know I'm starting with a lot of negatives, um, but truth be told, I thought this was a, uh, a decent enough movie, uh, I, I like the themes here, even though we have seen them all before, but, um, you know, I think Maya Rudolph gave a really good, um, sort of performance as the the nanny uh, and just that character is very well written there were some twists and turns with that specific character um that you know we're sort of unveiling as the kids are noticing them as well um you know the the twins are kind of creepy but again nothing we haven't really seen before um I, I think the objective of this movie would be to um you know to laugh i mean i would say it's probably a comedy above anything um, and it was funny in parts, for sure. Um, you know, there were some, some good visual gags. Um, Ricky Gervais as the cat was a good narrator. I'm sort of getting tired of Ricky Gervais's shtick, which is weird, because I was on board with him, like, way before a lot of people, like, back in the Office UK and the movie Stardust, and, you know, a lot of his, like, early performances. I was like, oh my god, I love this dude. You know, the movie Ghost Town I love. Um, but I would say the last, like five years or more, I, his his shtick has sort of worn on me. Um, and so I, I did get a few laughs at the narrator, but at the end of the day, it's just Ricky Gervais doing Ricky Gervais. Like, I just recently watched The Invention of Lying. Uh, that is on Netflix right now. And 
he gives pretty much the same performance as the narrator in that as he did here. Um, and he's voicing a cat here, so it's like maybe do something a little different. So um, I, I know I'm harping on this movie a lot, but I, I did enjoy watching it, and it was funny at parts. I just thought it kind of looked ugly, and the voice work could have been better. But the script was, was pretty good. Um, I just didn't think anything was all that original here. Um, you know, when when I read that the, um, you know, was it the, the director that did it, or, or maybe the animator specifically, um, worked on um, the, the Adams family and stuff, um, I don't know, uh, I was just like, well, that makes sense, like, this, this is clearly, like, sort of biting off of that vibe, and I liked the, um, yeah, I, I liked the, uh, the latest a Adams family movie, I thought they did a good job with it, but, um, this is, is definitely a little bit lower than that, um, so it is a slightly positive grade for the Willoughby's, um, I'm not sure how kids are going to enjoy it. Kids don't seem to like that stop animation look, like Missing Link and, you know, like the Leica films do it genuinely. They really do stop motion, you know, things like the box trolls and um, I'm trying to think the, the one with the little kid, Paranorman, you know, that's actually stop motion, but they never really light up the box office, um, you know, so I'm not sure if kids really like it as much as adults do from a technical standpoint um but i think they'll like the jokes in this movie anyway and i think they'll definitely like the plot they'll i think they'll feel at home especially kids that maybe don't have the happiest home life um could sort of see this as like okay well you know these kids are figuring out their problems for themselves they're choosing their own family good for them um, you know, so in that respect, but again, it's, it's very like Lemony Snicket too, at the same time. So I'm going to leave the Willoughby's with a B minus. Um, so we close with the half of it. Um, and this is the movie that I sort of, um, took it upon myself to kind of seek out every week. I try to find one movie that like, all right, if we weren't in quarantine, if we weren't shut down, I wasn't trying to fill four movies a week. Would I know that this movie exists? And maybe not. Um, it did do well at Sundance, although it did well at 2020 Sundance, which I don't even I didn't even think that existed. But maybe they did that before the shutdown. I don't know. But it won uh, one of the top prizes at, at Sundance uh, for narrative film. So um, it is written and directed um, by this gal Alice Wu, who this is only her second movie uh, that she's directed, and the first one was in the 90s. It was a long, or maybe it was the early 2000s, but it was a long time ago. Um, so, this one, um, you know, may may let her decide to keep going because the, the reviews for this have been very good. Essentially, uh, this movie is about this, this nerdy Asian gal um, who's named Ellie Chu, and she is in high school, and she basically gets her money um, from writing papers for people, and she writes a lot of them. Uh, and one of the teachers in, in a funny exchange knows it, uh, and, and she's like, listen, you gotta, you know, uh, step up your game because I'm getting a lot of failing, uh, <laughs> failing papers here. You gotta up your business here and, uh, you know, get some more clients or whatever. But, um, she ends up getting an assignment to write a love letter, uh, for a jock named... Uh, Paul Munsky, and uh, he is it has a thing for this girl, Aster, and um, he doesn't really know her, but he wants to, and, and he just is bad with words, so he, you know, is typical dumb jock, you know, um, and he's played by Daniel uh, Deemer, Ellie is played by Leah Lewis, and Aster is played by Alexis Lemire. And essentially, she starts writing these letters for him, and Alexis ends up really liking them and, and starts writing back, and sooner than later, um, it becomes almost a full-time gig for Ellie, which is why the teacher's like, dude, you gotta get back on writing these papers, um, because she's now devoting most of her time to writing letters in, you know, Paul's name. But in the meantime... Two things happen. She and Paul become really good friends who, you know, they've never really spoken before this. Um, and she ends up herself falling for Aster. 
Um, so it's revealed, you know, that, that she's, it's never really said if she's, you know, a lesbian or bi or queer or whatever, but, um, and it doesn't need to, which is the beauty of, you know, 2020. We don't need to necessarily label everybody. Um, but either way, essentially it is Cyrano de Bergerac or, you know, Steve Martin's Roxanne set in the modern day, set with texting, set with a queer bent to it. Um, and boy, I really liked it. It was, it was so good. First of all, um, all the, all three of the young actors, um, uh, are really good. Um, you know, Ellie specifically is great. You know, um, she's your typical bullied girl. I mean, I wish maybe there had been a little less generic characters here. Um, but you know, we work with what we have, but I, I, I thought it was charming. I thought it was funny. I think sometimes it tries a little too hard to be quirky, um, which is not sometimes like my biggest complaint. I don't mind some quirk, but, um, I don't know. I, I sort of think about the pinnacle of gay high school movies of the last decade. Um, you know, and Love, Simon is like right up there, cream of the crop, and um, this certainly falls short of that because I feel like that had more um, more realism, I guess, to it. And the characters were more defined and developed. And I think the humor flowed more naturally in that. But it all works here as well, just maybe not quite as well. Um, but I love the, the resolution sort of at the end. Um, and I don't do spoilers, so I'm not going to say what that is, but, um, there's some conversations that are had. If you've seen Cyrano de Bergerac or Roxanne, you, you probably can sort of guess. It doesn't go exactly along those same lines, um, but, but similar enough, I guess. Um, and there's a very funny scene in the church, uh, at the end of the movie, and I guess everybody in this town goes to the same church, um, you know, which, which is interesting, but, um, also... The, the father character, so uh, his name is uh, Colin Chow, is the actor, um, and he plays Edwin, Ellie's uh, father, and he is uh, mostly with the uh, Mandarin. He doesn't speak a lot of English, um, and so um, that's, that's sort of uh, his way of getting out of doing things, like, you know, Ellie's mom has died, and so she's basically become the the matriarch of the family she's the one who calls the the power company um because he's like oh they they don't understand my accent you know um and him and paul even forge a little bit of a friendship because uh paul really wants to be a chef he has all these these great ideas for cooking and um so he ends up a lot of time in her kitchen because his family's just kind of not so they have a huge family that likes to yell at each other and all of this um, so he ends up going to Ellie's house, and even when Ellie's not there, and sort of bonding with her father sometimes, too. So those are the kind of things I loved in this movie. Um, and that's where it sort of went kind of above and beyond even Love, Simon, to sort of explore some of the relationships outside just the sort of main crew um, and, and delve off into, you know, the one teacher or the, you know, Ellie's parent or whatever. Um, so this movie has a lot going for it. I don't think it's it's quite as... Um, you know, sharp or quirky as it as it wants to be, but these characters are great. The themes in this movie are fantastic because what's what's so cool about it is um, sort of I guess on the same tip of the Willoughby's, you know, choosing your your family, so to speak. Um, you know, here it's choosing your love. It's like, you know, you can have you can love this girl Aster, but you know, Paul and Ellie realize they also you know, loved each other as friends and they didn't even know each other before this. So, you know, the, the, the movie goes a long way to show you, um, that there's a lot of different kinds of love that are all sort of helpful to your, your worth and, and your self, self being, you know, we all need love and we all need, uh, to share love, you know? So I thought that was a good message. Um, and yeah, obviously because it's basically Cyrano de Bergerac, plot wise, I'm not sure it's breaking any new ground, but um, this was really, really a, a, a gem. I'm glad I stumbled upon this one. Uh, I gave the half of it an A-. minus. So that's going to do it for the show. Um, tomorrow we have The Masked Singer. I think Thursday I'm going to get up another TV review. I think there's enough shows uh, out in the last five days 
to uh, put up another TV review. I just did my last one a few days ago. Um, and then Friday, we've got another Frasier Friday. Um, and then, uh, once it hits the weekend, um, I'm not sure if we're going to do a video every single day anymore. Um, because I am going back to work at my part-time job. I've been doing my full-time job this whole time at home. So, um, but... I'm going to be doing about 15 hours a week at my part-time job. So I'm still going to do a lot of videos. Um, you know, if you enjoy watching my videos and they keep you company during the quarantine, that is awesome. Um, but I don't think they're going to be every single day anymore, which is fine because sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll struggle to figure out what to review for you guys or what to talk about. Um, so, you know, some days we just won't have one. And especially now that the season of the Connors is over, that wipes away, you know, one of my shows every single week that I do for you. But, um, I think once we hit day 60 of the quarantine, I think maybe we'll just sort of, uh, stop counting the days and just put up reviews, uh, when I, when the spirit moves me or, or whatever. But, um, but we have a, a pretty full slate. Oh, and I have a, a Dead to Me Season 2 review coming up too. Me, me and Melissa are going to talk about that over Zoom, um, as we did with Season 1 a few days ago. Um, that's the hottest thing on Netflix right now. That's number one. Uh, of the week is Dead to Me Season 2, so I'll definitely have a review for that coming up. But uh, those are the movies for this week. Next week, like I said, I'll be doing the Scooby-Doo movie, and then I'll find three more movies, maybe on Netflix, maybe on other streamers, um, or maybe there's more on demand that I just haven't caught up with yet, maybe uh, some other sort of under-the-radar movies. But uh, either way, we'll definitely have uh, a lot of movies uh, or and a lot of uh, reviews for you coming up. Um, but in the meantime, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, be safe, and we'll talk to you soon.